Um, we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 16, so just keep it open on your lap for the moment. And uh, you might like also to take your new sheet. Have you got that handy? And you'll be able to <clears throat> write down the outline that we have for today uh, in, in your new sheet. It's somewhere, somewhere near, oh, it's right on, the back, right on the back cover, so you can make a few notes on what's, uh, what's coming up as we look at God's word this morning. Let's pray before we do that. Heavenly Father, I am personally dependent on your spirit this morning, both for finding some voice and also for hearing your voice. We pray, Lord, that as we meditate on your word, as we think about what this difficult passage means, we may hear the voice that Hagar heard in the desert. Lord, be with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're following the church calendar, you will know that today is Pentecost Sunday, where traditionally we recall the facts of the events of the day of Pentecost that Luke wrote up for us in Acts chapter 2. And it seems to me that my task is very simple, really. Um, I want to open your eyes a little bit, or even a little bit more, to the wonder of who God is. And what he's done for every person, every one of us here in church, regardless of your background, your gender, your orientation, regardless of how you came to be here, regardless of your family or whatever, God has unleashed his spirit in the world in such a way that ordinary people like us can be on the receiving end of his love and his power. And that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. He gave himself to us he didn't give a theology or a religion or a philosophy or even a lifestyle he gave himself to his waiting disciples and it's very obvious from the story he also gave himself to thousands of other ordinary unsuspecting people like us who uh, who came to worship that day it was a once in a generation happening that kick-started the church of Jesus Christ as we know it. And my prayer as your pastor and for myself, my prayer is simply this when I read Acts chapter 2. Lord, for once in a lifetime, do it again. Bring the power of the Holy Spirit to bear on your waiting people in 2016 as you did in AD 30 something because that I believe is what makes the church of Jesus Christ stand out as different from the society in which we're placed it is the presence of the living God he gave himself to his people now you may say to me yes Ian I know that and I agree with you then please keep praying it What on earth has this got to do with Genesis chapter 16? Actually, if we go back to the previous chapter, I can tell you what it has to do with Genesis 16. Because in the previous chapter, in 15, God said to Abraham, I am your very great reward. It's there in 15 verse 1. I am your very great reward. I will give myself to you. I am your shield, your protector, and I am your great reward. And on the day of Pentecost, God gave himself to his people. He was their great reward. But here, in this incident that we're looking at today in the life of Abraham, what we're going to see is a counter-example to being filled with the Spirit. If Genesis chapter 15 was all about living by faith. Genesis chapter 16 is all about living on our wits. It's trusting no one except ourselves. God's word to Abraham was, I am your very great reward. But here, we're going to see Abraham trying to shortcut God's plan. So let's let's begin at 16.1, shall we? And look at the toxicity that there is in this situation. As the drama starts, there is a spiritually toxic cocktail. 
Because in Abraham, we see increasing frustration. And we can easily understand why. He's been waiting on God to give him and Sarai a child for 10 years, but there's no sign of it. And I can, I can imagine him. I can imagine him reasoning, well, maybe God expects me to do something myself. You know, God helps those who help themselves kind of touch. Although you will never find that statement in the Bible. So at this point, Abraham uses the logic of expediency. What's going to produce a result? Rather than the logic of faith. What has God promised? He's a man who is increasingly frustrated Not that he's frustrated sexually, he's frustrated that God doesn't seem to be living up to his promise of a child. Then I noticed Sarah. And in Sarai, there was mounting bitterness. Sleeping right next to Abraham every night was his wife. And verse 2 tells us, the Lord had kept her, or she puts it in her own words, the Lord has kept me from having children. And, And at first sound... That, that sounds very, very accepting. It sounds as if she's accepting that God takes us through tough times. But in the light of what is about to happen, we can hear an undertow of bitterness here. She's blaming God. The Lord has kept me from having children. And Sarai too. She must have been desperate. Come on. You can understand her situation. Because the suggestion that Abraham sleeps with her servant Hagar was hers, not his. What what forces would, would drive a wife to give away her exclusive right to sex with her husband? What could possibly have taken her to such a dark place where she gave up the deepest prerogative of a married woman? Now yes, she was now in her 80s. And she couldn't conceive how God would possibly fulfill his promise of a child through her, you know, through her creaking old body. And her biological clock had long since stopped ticking. And she was bitter. And bitterness is one of the most spiritually destructive of human emotions. It's, it's a chronic, it's a pervasive state of smouldering resentment and there may be some of us here in church this morning who on the private side of life are where Sarah was you've never been able to forgive God for something that didn't happen even like Sarah for not giving you that baby or for taking away the one that you thought you were going to have What I want you to know today is that as we open ourselves as fully as we can to receive God himself, he is our great reward, as Sarah could have done. That self-destruction can be turned around. Yes, we will still feel the pain of loss. But by his Holy Spirit, God can lift our bitterness. Bitterness need never have the last word. And another aspect of this toxicity, I notice, is is Hagar. She was an easily available person. Hagar was a servant girl. She'd been taken into the family when Abraham and Sarai lived in Egypt. And Sarai reasoned, well, she's of childbearing age. I'm not. This could be a solution. There's a telling phrase in verse 2. It says, Abraham agreed to what Sarai said. It seems as if Abraham here was guided by the voice of Sarai rather than guided by the voice of the Lord. So for Abraham, the temptation came from the most unexpected source, from his wife. And then another element in in this is actually the place where they all came from, Ur of the Chaldees. And that was a very liberal city. It was Abraham and Sarai's hometown, the one they'd left behind. It it seems as if Abraham had left Ur, but Ur hadn't left Abraham. And the custom of giving a slave to the master of the household in cases where the wife was barren is well attested in archaeology. 
And it's clear that the sex ethics in Ur was such that the, the city allowed this practice as a common thing to, to happen. And in Ur and in the surrounding area, when children were conceived this way, they were treated as full members of the family. And the principle here seems to be on Abraham's side that living by my wits and not by faith is often dressed up in the guise of, well, they all do it nowadays because that's the way they would have done it in Ur. That's what he had learned. That was the ethic that he picked up from the society around him. And as Christians, sometimes we have to stand out against the ethics of the society around us. We are part of that society. Let's not get that wrong. But there are times when we, we, we want to stand, make a positive stand for high standards of living and for, for ethics that respect the marriage bond. And furthermore, sometimes as Christians, we have to wrestle with God's weights. With those are times when there's a, a Lord saying to, when the Lord is saying to us, wait, wait for me. Wait for whatever it is I've got in store for you. So we can see here, there is a toxic mix of, uh, of, of circumstances. And then I, I'd like us to have a look at the, the emotional landscape that's here. As a consequence of, of what Abraham just decided, the emotional landscape in Abraham's family changed forever. Verse 3, so after Abraham had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. Uh, in Hebrew, there's not a great distinction between the word woman and, and the word wife. We could just put the word woman in there if you wanted. And he slept with Hagar, and she conceived. And it seems to me there are three noxious emotions that are coming into play here. First of all, there's derision. Looking down on someone with, with disdain. Look at verse 4. When Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. And we can imagine it. A little word dropped here after breakfast. A little one here before lunch. Every now and then a little word in the ear or with somebody else. Hagar started, started to be cynical. She started to deride. She started to look down on her mistress. Now the Hebrew word that we have behind our English despise in the text here, it means to make something small, to make it trifling, to make it dishonourable. And in the ancient Near East, a barren woman was no use to society because she consumed valuable resources without contributing children to the city. So by becoming a surrogate mother, Hagar deserved a higher place in that society than Sarai did. And so she began deriding her mistress. Then I noticed some blame shifting going on. Look at verse 5. Then Sarai said to Abraham, You are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. Hang on, whose idea was all this? <laughs> Sarai could see that this derision that sorry, this decision of hers had backfired and wanted to transfer the guilt onto somebody else. You are responsible, hubby. And that's something we can so often drift into, isn't it? You know, you get late for work and you think, what can I blame? <laughs> or if you don't pay up on time, it's okay, the check is in the post. How much better it would have been if Sarah had felt she could live in the truth and say, guys, I made a poor choice. So let's see if we can do the best we can to resolve it from the situation where we're in now. God knows that. Let's see if we can trust him to work this one through. Instead, she sifted the blame and became increasingly angry. And I noticed that from verse 5. Then Sarai said to Abraham, I put my servant in your arms and now she knows that she's pregnant. She despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Oh, so now she's taking it to a higher authority, eh? 
If the Lord was here judging between us, he'd find in my favour, she says. It was you who had sex with, with Hagar. Let's just sort of delve into what's going on here a bit. Uh, I, yeah, she was experiencing the one thing that probably makes us angry more than anything else. And that is a blocked goal. She had a goal. She had something she wanted to achieve and something came down to stop it happening. One of Sarai's life goals was to have children and to build a home. But she knows that's never going to happen, humanly speaking. But she's got this crazy, crazy husband who keeps saying, well, God will do it. God will do it. For 10 years he's been saying this, but no sign of a pregnancy. And anger is often sparked when a goal, something that we've longed for, dearly wanted to happen, something we've pinned our hopes on, is blocked. And frustration rises within her. And she takes matters into her own hands. My friends, it could have been so much better. And for us today, God by his spirit can bring us to a place of reassurance and peace when we acknowledge to him our blocked goals. Lord, you know what it is I really want. I lay that at your feet. And I'll trust you that you've got a better plan for my life than seeing that happen, even though I dearly wanted it. Any of us here this morning sitting here with blocked goals, things that cause us to be angry with God, or angry with ourselves, or angry with our family, and somehow something's got in the way. God, by his spirit, can bring us to a place of freedom and liberation recognising it was a goal it's probably a good goal but it's not in his plan for us and that brings freedom knowing that he loves us still and he has a plan for us still I know the plans I have for you says the Lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you hope and a future well, if there was, I said three, actually, I've got four. If there was derision, blame, shifting, and anger, there was also abdication in verse six. Uh, I'm sure we'd like to think of Abraham as this godly mentor, this sort of long-bearded, flowing road man with loads of wisdom that he imparts to everyone around him. Nonsense. He's actually a very complex personality when you read his life, and that's why I'm so keen that we look at it. Um, this is what actually happened, verse six. Abraham said to Sarai, your servant is in your hands. A phrase meaning, actually, love, she's your property. So you can do with her whatever you think best. And in so doing, he abdicated his responsibility. His responsibility as the leader of his household is to deal with problems like this, to lead by example. But he's turning his back. He's abdicating. And my dear friends, we, we abdicate difficult issues at our peril. God's blessing is able to flow when we face up to our obligations. Our obligations of simple things sometimes, like making a budget and sticking to it. Or to make the call I've been avoiding for weeks. Or to do the training that I know I need. Or to love my wife and family unconditionally. And when a man does that, God's blessing can flow. But Abraham didn't square up. And then the inevitable happened. Just look at, look at what it says in verse 6. Then Sarai ill-treated Hagar, so Hagar fled from her. Now, we began this morning saying that we desire God to be our very great reward, as Abraham did in Genesis chapter 15. But here we're seeing something very different. So where is God in all of this? Where can we find him? Well, it's a very moving chapter when you read it through and meditate on it slowly, which I recommend that you might like to do sometime later on today. Because the scene changes. We see Abraham and Sarai's misbehavior. Where is God? God is with Hagar. God met Hagar, not Abraham. God's heart turned towards the innocent victim of Sarai's ill treatment. 
Just because Abraham was the one receiving God's promise didn't guarantee that God would be with him when he sought to take matters into his own hands. He's using the Frank Sinatra philosophy of life. I did it my way, you know. I was going to sing those words, but I think discretion says otherwise. <clears throat> and this is, this is a, a word, a beware word for us who are long-standing Christians. It is so easy to think that we've got it together. And the Lord doesn't ask, what, did I, you know, what was I to you last week, last month or last year? He asks, what am I to you today? I am your very great reward. Receive me as such today. Can you see that in this sordid situation, even though Hagar blotted her copybook as well, in this sordid situation, it was Hagar who cried out to the Lord. And it was Hagar who discovered that God, hit, God hears when we call out to him. So God met Hagar here and not Abraham. And then I also noticed that God came to her at her very lowest point. What was she doing? She was probably heading back home to Egypt. She didn't expect God to speak to her. But then verse 7, look at it. The angel of the Lord or the messenger of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It's as if God went looking for her. Verse 8, and he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? These are the two nub issues. Where have you come from? I'm running away. Where are you going? Anywhere but there. My, my dear friends, if I'm talking to anyone who's on the run this morning from a difficult situation or on the run from abuse as she was, you're the innocent victim and you're running to avoid the pain. My friend, you're exactly where, God, where Hagar was when God found her. See, sometimes we have this idea that we've got to be this kind of super spiritual character. Everything's got to be rosy in the garden before God will meet with me. No, no, no. Here's an example, and there are many in the Bible, of God meeting with someone at their lowest point. He reached out to her at the moment when she least expected it. He met her at her lowest ebb. And God spoke to her because she was the person who would listen. Look at verse 9. God said, Hagar, I'm going to ask you, well, this is, this is there in the text, although it's not actually in the Hebrew. Hagar, I'm going to ask you to do the one thing that is hardest, the hardest thing you'll ever do in your life. I want you to go back and face it. Why? I'll tell you, Hagar, because I've made a promise to Abraham that his son would be the father of a great dynasty. That baby you're carrying is Abraham's son. So my promise, Hagar, will be, come to him. You have my word. Oh, and by the way, he'll be a feisty little what's it. And what was the boy, boy, boy's name? She was to give him, or he, Abraham, was to give him the name Ishmael. A word that means God hears. God hears. And let's not forget who it was he heard. It wasn't Abraham or Sarai. It was Hagar, the woman on the run from abuse. God hears. And so then we find her doing something quite extraordinary. We find her giving God a name. Now there are very few people in the Bible who are privileged with giving God a title. But she's one of them. She gave this name to the Lord. You'll find this in verse 13. Who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. And that is why the well, they were near a spring, we know that, that's why the well is called Beer Lahai Roy, which means the well of the living one who sees me. And it was still there at the time of writing when Genesis was penned. 
My friends, she gave God a name that showed how God had behaved towards her. You're the God who sees me. Can I retell a little story from uh, when I used to work in mathematics? I was working for BP and we had a particularly complex piece of software that my team and I were working with. <clears throat> and it was proving a pain to get working. 90% of the time it would be absolutely fine and all of a sudden it would just fall over. We couldn't work out why and there was a lot of mathematics in it um, and you don't need to know the details but when you have a mathematical method you transfer it into a computer program. That's quite a long and, and a technical process. It's, it's not the kind of thing you can get out of a book. It was all new work. Nobody had done it before. And we couldn't get this thing going. And uh, one of the men I was working with, one of the men on my team, he, um, he, he, he was a Christian. And uh, we were sitting together up in, up in London. I was working at their head office at the time. And I said to him, look, I think we just need to pray about this. I think my team had been working on it for a couple of months and we hadn't managed to crack why it didn't work properly. I think we need to pray about this. And he sort of looked at me and said, oh, I've never thought about praying about computer programs before. So but anyway, we did. Do you know, that afternoon we found what the bug was. It was a letter O had been replaced with a zero. And that's all it was. And the... Well, I think what by that time was about 30,000 lines of code there was one letter that was wrong when we found that the whole thing just fell into place I felt like giving God a name you're, you're the God who finds my bugs because <laughs> it might well have been me that put it in there I, you never know uh, you're the God who finds my bugs can you see what Hagar's doing here She's taking the way in which God acts towards her and giving him that name. Can I ask you, my friends, what name would you give him? For, for, look at your own experience. What name would you give the Lord? What moment has he found you? And done something in your life or something's changed and you say, you're the God who sees me. You're the God who finds me a parking space. You're the God who fixes my bugs. You're the God who heals me. You're the God who helps me see beyond a block goal. Because that's what being filled with the Spirit is like. It's receiving God for himself. It's receiving the fullness of God into the poverty of a human soul. I am your shield, God said to Abraham, and your very great reward. God is for you. He is greater than you. I love that line that Alistair chose in one of the songs this morning. He is slow to blame and swift to bless. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for its simplicity and its clarity. And as we open our hearts before you this morning, we thank you that you are a God who is for us. You are a God who is greater than us. You are a God who loves us. That you deal with tough stuff and you bring us to a place of communion with you. Father, fill us afresh with your spirit, we pray. And we'll be careful to give you the glory. Amen. Thank you, Ian.